Good morning. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you all so very much for joining us. It is now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, World in Danger, Germany and Europe, an Uncertain Time. This is a partnered program with the American Council on Germany. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Sokol, who is president of the American Council on Germany. Stephen will be introducing, so just please hang with us and this will be a terrific program. Thank you so much and, and on to you, Stephen. Thank you so much, Kim. The American Council on Germany is delighted to partner with the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall to host today's event. Our speakers, Wolfgang Ischinger and John B. Emerson, hardly need introductions, but they deserve them. However, before introducing them, it's worth noting that today marks two important anniversaries. One is dark and the other is bright, but both have shaped the world that we live in today. On the night of November 9th, 1938, violent anti-Jewish demonstrations broke out across Germany. This night became known as Kristallnacht, or the night of broken glass. And of course, just over 30 years ago, during the night of November 9th, 1989, crowds of East Germans peacefully crossed into West Berlin. The fall of the Berlin Wall marked the end of the Cold War and paved the way to German unification on October 3rd, 1990. Our speakers today are no strangers to important dates. A seasoned diplomat, Wolfgang Ischinger joined the German Foreign Office in 1975. Over the course of his distinguished career, he served as State Secretary and as the German Ambassador to both the United Kingdom and the United States. As a matter of fact, he arrived in Washington, D.C. as German Ambassador on the eve of September 11th, 2001, and he spent the following years navigating one of the deepest crises in transatlantic relations. Since 2008, Wolfgang Ischinger has been the chairman of the Munich Security Conference. In 2018, he wrote a book in German called A World in Danger. In that book, he chronicled the myriad challenges to the global order. And just last month, this book came out in English. Perhaps it should have been titled A World in Grave Danger instead, but I'll leave that to John Emerson to discuss with Wolfgang Ischinger. John Emerson is the vice chairman at Capital Group International and serves as the chairman of the American Council on Germany's board. Previously, he served as the US ambassador to Germany from 2013 to 2017. In 2015, he received the State Department's Sue M. Cobb Award for Exemplary Diplomatic Service, an award given annually to one non-career ambassador. And in 2017, the Secretary of the Navy and the Director of the CIA awarded him with their highest civilian honors for his service. In his case, it's worth noting that John Emerson arrived in Berlin just in time to get drawn into a full-fledged political storm between Berlin and Washington dubbed Handygate. Suffice it to say, both ambassadors have experienced the ebb and flow of the German-American relationship firsthand. Early in their careers, they also participated in American Council on Germany programs focused on the successor generation. And it's my pleasure now to welcome both ambassadors. So John, <clears throat> while we wait for Wolfgang Ischinger to join us, um, let me maybe ask you for your first take on the election results and the policy implications for the transatlantic relationship. Well, thanks, Steve. First of all, thanks so much for having me. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to being with uh, our mutual friend, Wolfgang Ischinger. Uh, Wolfgang was one of the uh, wise men with whom I met uh, shortly after uh, arriving in Germany in, in August of, uh, of 2013, as I was trying to get my feet on the ground there. And uh, thanks also for mentioning the importance of November 9th. I, in 2013, uh, my family and I uh, commemorated the uh, 75th anniversary of Kristallnacht and um, uh, went to a very long um, uh, service and, uh, and commemoration of that terrible day. 
And of course, one year later, uh, with, the, with my family as well, we were able to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall. And that was, uh, that was actually a glorious, glorious night. So, uh, so thank you for mentioning those as well. Uh, in terms of the election, uh, you know, hey, I've been saying, maybe even on some of, uh, of the World Affairs Council, I know for sure the American Council on Germany uh, podcasts or webinars, that the election was going to be a lot closer than the polls suggested. Uh, and, um, and I talked about the red mirage, you know, the possibility that we would have an election night in a couple of the key states where because uh, Donald Trump was encouraging his voters to vote on election day and in fact actively discouraging them from voting in the mail and because 70% of Democratic voters said they intended to vote by mail because they were concerned in part about COVID, uh, that we would have this dynamic where the initial numbers coming in on election night would look very, very good for President Trump, but as the mail-in ballots were counted, and, and it takes a long time to count those because you have to validate them first, um, we could well begin to see a uh, shrinking of that lead, and and in Here fact that is what that is what happened. So uh, I'll just uh, conclude because I see Ambassador Ishinger is here with us right now by saying that um, uh, I think unquestionably uh, we've seen uh, the vice president reach out a hand or the president elect reach out a hand. Uh, with a commitment to work as hard as he can to unify the country and represent all Americans, including those who didn't vote for him. And I think we will definitely see something that I would expect we'll get into in this conversation, which is a, a bit of a shift uh, in American foreign policy and in, in particular in our approach to Europe. So Wolfgang, welcome. It's good to see you. I finally made it. I'm sorry that we had some technical problems. Uh, it always happens at the worst moment, of course, as we all know. But I'm glad we've now finally established a, a, a channel. And uh, here we go. I'm so glad to see you, John, and of course, uh, 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 everybody else, uh, uh, Steve Sokol. And uh, here I am. So let's well, let's get started. Wonderful. Well, thanks for joining us. And you know, it, it is pretty miraculous that we can do this. You're in Germany. I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, Steve is in New York, and we have the World Affairs Council folks in Los Angeles, and we're all zooming all over the world here. So, you know, folks, I'm uh, really excited to have uh, my my good friend and um, uh, and really advisor in many respects as I was uh, uh, sort of finding my way as ambassador in Germany, Wolfgang Ischinger here. Uh, I'm holding up the book. It's a book I would suggest all of you buy and read. Good quick read. It is an important read. It's a, in effect a, a tour through the last 40 years of uh, in not just transatlantic foreign policy, but global foreign policy written by a man who was in the room for so many of the consequential moments during that period of time. And, uh, and I look forward to um, diving it in, into it with you, uh, Wolfgang. Let me just start out by talking about the elephant in the room. Uh, you know, while much of the danger that we faced and, and that you articulate in the world of danger was related to the fact that the United States of America, particularly under America First and the presidency of Donald Trump, was withdrawing from global leadership in so many, in so many respects. And yet you also point out uh, that many of these problems that we face and challenges we face are unrelated to Donald Trump and unrelated to America first uh, foreign policy. And you point out that uh, much of what Donald Trump came to represent is symptomatic of underlying dynamics within the United States and not necessarily uh, that he was more a reflection of that rather than uh, a cause of some of these changes. But now that Joe Biden has been elected president of the United States, what changes do you anticipate and will the world be a little less in danger as a consequence? Well, John, first of all, it's a joy to see you. It is, it is a wonderful pleasure for me to, uh, to, to talk to you and to others uh, today. This is, of course, a moment of joy 
because it is a moment where not only you Americans, uh, you know, uh, are fond of having elected a future president, but it is a moment where uh, we on the European side feel that we may be looking at a, a new opportunity, a new opportunity uh, uh, to come together. The problem that I see, I mean, you know, let's first say, you know, this is, this is a great opportunity. Uh, but what I'm seeing here on the European side makes me a little worried because I see a lot of euphoria, you know, wow. This reminds me of, you know, the moment when Barack Obama, not even a uh, confirmed presidential candidate in the summer of 2008, showed up in Berlin and literally, as you know, uh, 200,000 people congregated and, and applauded and cheered a, a future candidate. He was not, of course, this was before the presidential elections. So the level of expectation, uh, not only in Germany, in Europe, of course, is enormous as far as the role of the president of the United States is concerned. And I think the, my worry is that people may conclude that, you know, now the era of problems is over and we can, can just sort of recline and wait for Joe Biden to, to make everything right. And I think that is far beyond what we, or actually you Americans, uh, can expect from your president. He's, he faces, as I understand, he faces huge challenges. He faces the pandemic. He faces um, a, a world that is in disarray, uh, a world with growing great power rivalries, uh, uh, a, a world that is changing so dramatically that we in Europe, uh, we're probably the last ones to understand, to have started to understand how dramatic these changes are. So what I think we need to do, quite frankly, is we need to get our act together uh, and do a better job, we on the European side, to be a more significant, a more relevant, uh, a more worthy partner of the United States. We cannot, as remember, as Chancellor Merkel repeatedly said, we cannot expect the United States to take care, like as if we were a baby, to take care of all of our uh, little pains and, and, and problems. We need to become adult participants in a relationship uh, where surely the United States will be sorely needed in Europe because you're the only ones who, who can provide strategic security for, for Europe, but we can do a better job helping you out elsewhere. That's my view. Well, I think that uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, uh, uh, during my time as ambassador, we were pushing hard and, and we're actually very gratified to hear uh, first, um, uh, the foreign minister at the time, Frank Walter Steinmeier, and then secondly, the defense minister, Ursula von der Leyen, at the 2014 Munich Security Conference, uh, really forcefully talk about the importance of Germany taking much more of a leadership role uh, in global affairs. And that was, uh, that was, I think, a very consequential conference and, and sort of began to move things along. Uh, obviously, um, Emmanuel Macron has... Uh, has taken that uh, that cudgel up uh, as well, and uh, I guess the question is, uh, might I happen to be one who believes that a strong and independent Europe is both in the United States' national security interest as well as its uh, international economic interest? And uh, how do you think that's going? And you talk a little bit about this in the book. We don't get into it too much in terms of the response to COVID, but you know we've had Brexit. Uh, I think the European response to that's actually been pretty good. We've had the COVID crisis. I think that was very dangerous, but now we have a stabilization package, which is uh, pretty extraordinary, um, both from the standpoint of uh, uh, really historic passage I don't, a, a chapter. I don't think it's a, quite a Hamiltonian moment, but uh, at the EU, we have Germany willing to actually go into debt uh, to help um, uh, assist uh, the neighbors to the south. But what, what's your sense as to how Europe is uh, managing through this and whether, again, thinking about a world in danger, is Europe going to come through this 
uh, in even a stronger position than it was before. Well, I sure I sure hope so. I mean, let's just go back to this moment in 2014. This was, of course, during the uh, Barack Obama presidency, when our president at the time came to the Munich Security Conference and said, we need to take more responsibility. Now, when I look back at that six years ago, it is amazing to me how much our world here in Europe and the global situation has changed. Uh, six years ago, we did not know that Brexit would happen. Mm -hmm. That only happened in 2016. Uh, um, six years ago, we did not know that in your country, Donald Trump would be elected a president who liked to be seen as a disruptive president who changed the way we interacted with each other in a in a in a rather straightforward and uh, sometimes brutal uh, manner. Um, six years ago, we did not know that we would we should have known, but but we sort of um, didn't take notice of of warnings. Uh, that, uh, the, the, you know, these types of pandemics could hit us in the transatlantic community, but far beyond the entire world. Six years ago, we did not know in, uh, uh, in February of 2014 that within a month, Vladimir Putin would, would annex Crimea and would start a kind of invasion in eastern Ukraine. And little did we know to what extent the conflicts in the Middle East would would erupt when when you think of Libya and and Syria and Yemen and uh, and and then Mali in Africa and 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 you can continue. In other words, I think we've had a very hard time grasping the dramatic the the the, dim, the dramatic dimension of these uh, changes, not only in our own neighborhood but uh, on the global scale. When I think of uh, the, the changes in Chinese foreign policy, the more aggressive uh, uh, Chinese behavior. So I, I hope, I hope I'm right. I hope that we will, when we look back at this period of the last couple of years, including at the Trump era, that this will be seen, looking back, as a kind of wake up call to us on the European side. We need to get our act together. And what does this mean? It does not only mean to spend more on defense. Yes, it means that we need to spend more on defense, probably significantly more. But it also means that we need to come to Washington, not with 27 different foreign ministers having 27 different uh, little speeches to present, but we should come to you guys with one message. Here is our offer of partnership. We have a, some things to offer. We also have some requests of the United States. When you talk about trade, when you talk about Russia, when you talk about China, and uh, among the things we will probably want to say is, we don't think it's a great idea to hit friends with sanctions. Uh, I think we, we believe that sanctions may be uh, occasionally uh, uh, the only uh, option we have to deal with uh, situations like Belarus or Russia, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but hitting friends with sanctions appears to be not the best uh, way forward. So uh, I think, but I, I think we should not come to Washington individually, uh, you know, as the French, as the Germans, as the Spanish and Italians, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but we should have uh, an arranged, a coordinated message. That would make life so much easier for you to deal with these very small European countries in a in a way that uh, you don't have to have uh, 27 different meetings. Well, I think uh, for that would be a wonderful goal, but my guess is uh, <laughs> you know, we're still a long way away from that, uh, uh, notwithstanding the progress that has been made. But let's uh, well, well, let me well, you know, John, let me say that. Uh, it's, it's, it is some, you know, things are moving. Um, five years ago, it would have been not possible to imagine that serious people would advocate 
abandoning the the requirement of unanimity in foreign policy decision making in the in the EU. Now, when you look at it, Chancellor Merkel has advocated it. Uh, I mean, I in, in my book, uh, thanks for showing it around. In my book, I'm arguing this point. I think we need to uh, go towards majority voting in the European Union so that not everybody has a veto on every little question so that we're more capable of, of coming up with decisions. So, you know, Chancellor Merkel is in favor of it. The foreign minister from the coalition partner, SPD, is in favor of it. Uh, the uh, largest parliamentary groups in the European Parliament are in favor of it. There are some countries that are opposed to it, yes. But in other words, the mood is changing and more and more decision makers are beginning to understand that we can't continue to behave as if there was no problem. We need to recognize the fact that if we can't speak with one voice, we shouldn't be uh, we shouldn't be surprised if we're not being taken seriously in trying to defend the interests of, uh, you know, 450 million people. I think the, uh, as for some of our listeners, just to explain, the EU is a, quote, consensus organization. And that doesn't mean we sit in a room and sort of come up with an agreement. Effectively, what it has meant is that every member state has a veto power over any decision and something that uh, Ambassador Ischinger has been arguing for quite some time, very effectively, and, and it's an important point, is that we're never gonna get to that world that you're just describing there, Wolfgang, uh, with that simple veto power. So I think that is very encouraging that we're moving in the direction. Just to, maybe this is two in the weeds, but a question, what does it take? Does it take a unanimous vote to change that rule? Well, uh, here's my recipe. In principle, it does take uh, a consensus decision by the European Council, by the heads of state and government, to allow uh, a move toward uh, majority voting. But, you know, I think there are smart initial steps that, uh, that leader countries like, in this case, Germany, maybe with France and others, could take. For example, we could go to Brussels and declare solemnly that for, henceforth Germany, if there is ever a situation where we are, you know, 26 to 1, where Germany is about to cast its veto to, to prevent a, a decision from being taken, and that, that in this case we would not cast a veto, we would abstain in order to allow the decision to go forward. In other words, we would forego the use of the veto voluntarily. And then we would add, please, my friends, consider whether you, you don't want to follow our example, because we are, we're here to strengthen the capability of the European Union to act and to, and to deserve respect in a world of uh, growing rivalries. So I, you know, I think this is about changing the way people think in um, various capitals, and uh, it will not be a decision that can be uh, take that be can be taken for granted overnight. But we need to set in motion a process to move the European Union in a in a new era. John, you mentioned this, you know, whether it's a Hamiltonian moment or not. Uh, we we may want to disagree. But surely it was a very important step that the European Union, in the face of the pandemic, decided that we can't continue along the uh, normal uh, procedures. We need a new facility, a new capability to, uh, to allow the European Union to, disper to dispend more money, more, more resources to uh, member countries. So the debt issue was all of a sudden open. It had been a taboo, especially for us in Germany, for decades. And so the crisis, and I think that's the trick uh, that you know and I know, that the question is, how can you benefit from a crisis? And the crisis always allows, if you do it smartly, uh, 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 always allows to, to use opportunities to move forward. In other words, never waste a crisis. 
And I hope we will be smart enough uh, not to waste the current crisis of dramatic changes in world global balances and, and, and conflicts, but also in the pandemic situation to move the European uh, Union forward and turn it into a more meaningful partner of the United States. Well, and, and by the way, when I said I didn't think it was quite a Hamiltonian moment, I did not at all mean to suggest that it wasn't hugely significant and, and very, very positive. Uh, but uh, so anyway, glad to see us move in that direction. Let me pick up on something else you talked about, which was the issue of sanctions. I assume you were in part referring to this threat of sanctions on German companies uh, because of Nord Stream 2 that the yeah, Trump administration yeah. has imposed, and also uh, candidly, the tariffs on aluminum uh, and steel, which, uh, you know, it's not, you know, European or German companies that are the problem there, but those tariffs uh, persisted. One one thing I thought uh, was encouraging was Tony Blinken, who uh, we both know well, who's, uh, uh, you know, a President-elect Biden's closest foreign policy advisor and odds are, you know, probably his next national security advisor. Uh, gave a speech to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce a few weeks ago where he said one of the uh, things that uh, President Biden would do quickly would be to, quote, end the artificial trade war with Europe, which I think is uh, obviously a positive thing. Um, that maybe relates to and maybe foreshadowing what may happen on the steel and aluminum tariffs. But beyond that, let's talk a little bit more about sanctions, because you get into this in your book uh, somewhat, both the they can be, they can have uh, 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 knock-on effects that are actually quite bad and punish people. You you have a an exchange with uh, Chancellor Merkel that you talk about about her experience with uh, sanctions uh, when she was growing up in uh, East Germany and not being able to get bananas in the uh, grocery store because of sanctions that we imposed on Russia. And uh, and it was like, wait, why are we being punished? But but clearly uh, sanctions. For instance, on Russia, uh, it, as a response to uh, their uh, annexation of Crimea and the and 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 really creating this uh, conflict in the Donbass region, I know something you've been deeply involved in. Um, those seem to be pretty important and pretty good. Can you give us some uh, you know, some of your thinking on the use of sanctions, which seems to be something that we go to more and more frequently in this um, uh, in this uh, post. Uh, you know, Cold War world. Absolutely. I, I, I think the sanctions discussion uh, has been one of the those fascinating areas where we used to regard uh, the sanctions question as a very crude instrument. And over the last decade or so, under le leadership, uh, uh, I, 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 I would immediately uh, uh, say under the leadership of the United States, the instruments of sanctions have been refined in a way that makes uh, sanctions far more useful than the the kind of you know flat out sanctions that you would slap on a country uh, and hit everybody. And it, uh, I'm glad you you uh, uh, you remember the. A little story I tell in the book, and and, uh, and let me recall uh, what you are referring to is a conversation which Angela Merkel had immediately after her first election as chancellor. She came to the White House. I was ambassador in Washington at the time, and one of the items of discussion <clears throat> with uh, then President George uh, W. Bush was. And he asked her, what about sanctions against Iran? This was a, an issue in 2005, 2006. And uh, she said, yeah, uh, the problem is that you need to uh, find out whom you're going to want to punish with your sanctions. And, and that was the moment she said, you know, when the United States, when she was a kid in the former you know, Soviet-dominated GDR, um, her family uh, asked themselves questions if because of U.S. sanctions against the Soviet Union, they did not, they were unable to buy bananas in their local grocery store. And they said, why are we being punished? And, and I remember very well how President Bush uh, took that her and said, 
I'm getting it, you're talking targeted sanctions. And that was the beginning of a, of a, of a bilateral discussion about how we could conceivably uh, do this uh, in the case of Iran and, and then later in other cases. Uh, I do think that we have a, in, we have this German word, the Instrumentenkasten. This is sort of the, the, the toolbox, the toolbox of sanctions today is not just a hammer and a saw, it's more like the instruments of a, of a surgeon, you know, very fine instruments. And you can, you can actually hit 20 people in Belarus, uh, whom we have identified as the guys uh, responsible for certain repressive acts, uh, police activities, uh, secret service uh, activities, uh, human rights violations, et cetera, et cetera. These types of sanctions that are targeted against individual or specific institutions, I think can and, and have shown to be uh, quite, uh, uh, quite effective. And so they have been a, an important instrument. But what I do believe is that, and I, re I can only repeat this, I think we should try not to consider uh, these types of uh, economic or political sanctions uh, in our relationship between friends and partners, whether it's alliance partners or or neighbors or EU partners. It's just, I think, not appropriate. If we have differences, we need to be able to figure them out and, and work out a solution without these types of threats of, of sort of mutual punishment. That's that I think that's a question of style and 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 uh, uh, and and and, 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 and it, it has to do with the fundamental definition of the kind of relationship that we, we want to have with each other. Uh, now, let me add a word about, about Nord Stream 2. I know that many on the American side uh, share the view that, you know, it is difficult to grasp uh, that Germany in a situation where we have more and more and more uh, uh, contentious issues, and some really uh, extremely uh, alarming issues with Russia. Um, uh, uh, how can we continue this pipeline business to be to be uh, uh, to be going forward? Uh, I I have my own view on this. I believe that my own government made a mistake in the early stages of these pipeline arrangements because we said this is a this is just a business deal this is you know company a working with company b and putting together a consortium and then they work with gazprom and they provide gas or oil uh, to western europe uh, actually what what i know today and i think what everybody knows today these types of uh, uh, energy deals are not just business deals they are strategic they have strategic implications on our relationship, certainly on Russia, on my own country, but also on the neighborhood, on Ukraine, on Poland, and, and, and others who are directly or indirectly affected either because uh, the pipeline running through their own country is no longer going to be necessary, um, and therefore they, they become, um, uh, it's, it's going to be easier to put pressure on them because they are no longer required. This is true in the case of Ukraine. So I think we underestimate it, uh, but this of course goes back to the to an era when our problems with Russia were not of the nature that they are today. This was at the moment when we still believed that uh, you know the future is with Russia and not not against Russia. Uh, you know, I have a book with me here which we published, we the Munich Security Conference. In 2013, this was a year before uh, Maidan, before the annexation of Crimea, and a couple of Russian authors participated in writing this book, and many Americans uh, participated. And here's the title: I have a copy with me here, "Towards Mutual Security." You know, when I look through this volume today, it I, it, it 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 looks to me as if it was written a hundred years ago. It it is not relevant anymore in 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 a world that is that, that is only, you know, six years, uh, that has moved six years uh, further. So things have changed dramatically. And 
and um, uh, Nord Stream 2, if it, uh, if, if, it, it, if it were presented as a project today, would surely not be approved by anyone. But it comes from an era when, when at least in my own country, people thought that, well, you know, why not? Why not? We've been uh, we're getting getting cheap uh, gas and oil from the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and it was okay. Um, so I think we need to rethink these relationships in a very fundamental manner as going forward. Yeah, and of course, the thing that geopolitically changed um, uh, the, the view on Nord Stream was the whole situation in Ukraine and concern that, yeah, R Russia would then hold a real stranglehold on ukraine in terms of the you know gas transit that they depend on for a lot of their revenues let me let's talk about russia for a second you talk in your book and i love this uh uh and you've met so many foreign leaders and uh you know had a chance to to not just shake their hand but actually sit down and, and get to know them you talk about putin number one and putin number two why don't you unpack that a little bit okay well look when um when we had a change in government in, in Germany in 1998, remember Helmut Kohl, who had been a long-serving chancellor, was voted out of office, and in came his successor, Gerhard Schroeder. Um, and um, uh, within a year or, or, or so of his um, uh, accession to the chancellery, Vladimir Putin, who had also just been elevated to the presidency of Russia, came to uh, to Berlin actually and um, gave a speech in the Reichstag in our parliament. Uh, the, the main message uh, uh, at the time was, I want to move Russia closer to Western Europe. You guys are my partners. It was an offer of partnership in a, in a, in a, in a large sense of, of the word. And uh, so that is the Putin one that I'm, talking about in the book and I had uh, the one of my responsibilities was to accompany uh, the German Chancellor whenever he had bilateral discussions with Vladimir Putin and I can only tell you and 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 the listeners uh, and those who watch this uh, program here that in those early days talking about 99 2000 2001 uh, Working with Vladimir Putin was a pleasure. We uh, we would say to the Russian government, uh, we have a problem with certain import uh, restrictions regarding some wood uh, wooden products or this, and uh, uh, Putin would say uh, to his minister in, uh, at the table, so why are we having these uh, problems? And some explanation would be given. And Putin would then issue uh, an order, an instruction, would say, as of tomorrow, this problem is resolved. Next problem. Uh, can we talk about other problems? Gerhard Schroeder liked this very much. Uh, they got along beautifully. We actually resolved problems in trade and investment for our companies. This was Putin number one. Putin number two was the guy who showed up in Munich at, at what is now my conference, but this was before I took over this responsibility in 2007. Putin showed up in, in, in uh, Munich and said, uh, I've had it. I am not going to take it anymore. I don't like a world which where I am uh, suffering from, I mean, this is not his words, from an American diktat, and uh, uh, I'm going to uh, create a situation where Russia um, is going to be respected, um, and uh, we are not uh, going to tolerate further uh, enlargement decisions by NATO, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know the whole list of of, uh, of unhappy uh, uh, issues. And and I think at the time when Mr. Putin number two manifested himself, you know whether it was in 2006 or in 2007 or in 2008. Um, uh, I think we underestimated to what extent he had, in fact, decided to be now a Putin number two and not to continue uh, this line of, you know, uh, peaceful uh, cooperation. We underestimated it at the time. I remember that even after 
what, what we call the little war in Georgia in the summer of 2008, when Russia invaded, in fact, uh, Georgia. Uh, we tried, we on the European side, but I think also some in, in the US, uh, tried to maintain the idea that, well, of course, that was a problem and maybe, um, and who knows who was guilty of this, but we can still work with, uh, uh, with Russia. We underestimated the degree to which he had decided that he was now going to clamp down, pursue his own course, use military uh, capabilities to defend um, uh, Russian interests and, um, and change into the kind of Putin number two, which we are now dealing with, which is uh, Putin, uh, who is not a partner anymore, but a, uh, a difficult neighbor for us. Well, interesting, uh, and uh, and again, kind of interesting how consequential these uh, the Munich Security Conference can be in terms of these events. Let's um, uh, I, I, one of the other topics you we touched on a number of topics where we really do require uh, us all to be working together to resolve them. Obviously, climate change is a, a huge example of that. Uh, transnational terrorism, uh, the refugee crisis, and and we're moving into a time when we're going to see more and more climate refugees, but also nuclear nonproliferation. And one of the, uh, you know, this America alone became America withdrawing. Two of the things that uh, the United States withdrew from in the last couple of years were the uh, Intermediary Nuclear Forces Agreement, the INF with Russia, and also, of course, the JCPOA, the, uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on whether either of those are salvageable. Uh, I think the uh, Biden uh, campaign at least made clear uh, its interest in trying to, um, you know, sort of restore those agreements and get back on ta track and that nuclear nonproliferation would be a priority. But what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would hope, uh, first of all, you know, I think we are, uh, all of Europe is, uh, relieved feels feels very good about the uh, expectation that a future Biden administration would become a very serious and of course key partner again in uh, uh, in working together on climate change that is uh, if you look for you know the popular vote in Europe that is probably the number one concern climate change. In most of the polling that I've seen recently, people don't think that nuclear missiles are the major threat to our future well-being, but climate change. So if, if uh, the Biden administration can, uh, can help us uh, deal with the uh, climate issues, uh, I think the Biden administration would be uh, quite, quite quickly uh, quite popular in Europe. Point number one. Point number one on the uh, Iran issue. Uh, uh, I understand that, uh, given the the history of of, of this, uh, and given uh, given the the mood in 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 your Congress, uh, certainly even before the advent of Donald Trump. Uh, the difficulty that the uh, that the Obama administration had in 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 uh, convincing uh, members of the Senate that this was a good and not a bad idea. So I understand that this is not an not an easy one. What I would hope uh, what I would hope for is that the decision makers in Iran would uh, take a look at this and consider. A resumption of a discussion with the United States, with the Biden, future Biden administration, as an important opportunity for themselves. But I think if this, if we expect this to go forward, uh, we don't, we, we cannot expect simply to go back to the old JCPOA that we signed in 2015. I think we would need to. Um, to arrange with the Iranians for a forward leaning discussion that would include some of those issues that that 
we were unable to cover in the first initial JCPOA. Uh, you know, and we, we, we've we been discussing this, of course, over the years in, in, rather intensely. What about Hezbollah? What about uh, Iranian regional behavior? What about ballistic missile development, yes, exactly. uh, et cetera? There's a whole list of issues that, of course, were not covered. This is always the problem with diplomatic negotiations. You get out of a negotiation what you can get out of a negotiation, but maybe not what is desirable to get out of this negotiation. It's always, you know, the art of the possible and not the, not the art of the wishful, of the of the desirable. Um, so I would hope that we can convince the Iranian leadership uh, that this is an opportunity for them to re-engage and to start a discussion about these larger issues. Um, uh, in with the, with the aim of of uh, reaffirming the, the the foundations of the of the JCPOA. Now, the problem is, or part of the problem is that you have just had your election in the United States. The Iranians have an election, as I remember, uh, in the late spring of next year. So, my own sense would be that maybe we're not going to get much of a movement in this situation before the conclusion of their elections. And hopefully, between now and then, nothing will happen that would, that would uh, uh, pour additional, uh, uh, that, that, would, that would create additional support for the so-called hardliners in Iran. So, you know, I'm sort of, I'm holding my breath. I would hope that both sides would find it uh, useful to exercise uh, diplomatic and, uh, and, and, and political restraint uh, in order not to create any pretext for Iranian hardliners to, to gain, uh, uh, to, 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 to make more inroads in, in, in Tehran. And then hopefully uh, by the summer of, uh, of, of next year, to hopefully start exploratory discussions. That would be my best expectation. Let's be realistic. This is going to be a tough cookie, uh, a, a tough one. Uh, uh, but I would hope that now again, uh, we would be as united as we were when John Kerry led the US delegation uh, along with Ernest Moniz and uh, worked very, very closely with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the high representative of the European Union for foreign policy, um, and of course the uh, the other European members, the UK, France, and, and 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 Germany. You know, in retrospect, the efforts undertaken since 2003, initially by the EU3, and then with with support and finally with leadership from the United States, it's one of the first remarkable success stories that we on the European side can point to where actually the European Union has been able to participate in a meaningful, relevant, important international negotiating, negotiating process. Uh, that is why we would of course be delighted if we could with American support and leadership uh, get this process started again. But moving beyond the the uh, 2015 JCPOA. We need to add uh, other fields to it, hopefully. Oh yeah, no question about that. And I think in terms of the Iranian election, uh, uh, President Biden's gonna have his hands full dealing with the pandemic and, and trying to get our economy back on track, certainly in the opening uh, months of the administration as well. Let me ask, and Jessica, I don't know if you have uh, audience questions that you want to jump in here with, but uh, while you're thinking about that, let me just ask one final question. We are, those of us in Los Angeles, also Pacific facing. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, question, obviously, about China, relationship with China. Uh, Wolfgang, you and I both spoke at a conference in uh, Bavaria last September, and this was one of the big topics. It was the concern about America decoupling with China, and pressure you know to on the Europeans to join with us, and a real question, and I think um, uh, in a, a post Trump era, this uh, question will persist of um, do Europe and the u s work together 
in addressing China uh, or uh, do we go our own ways? Uh, maybe a quick, I know that's not a quick, easy one to answer quickly, but a quick thought on that and then Jessica will come in with some audience questions. Okay, very quickly. I, actually, I think this is probably the single biggest challenge for us in the transatlantic uh, arena uh, because it will be with us for a long time to come, the, the, the best way to deal with China. Uh, I think it's not, not going to be easy because as far as I can see uh, in your country, there is a rather broad majority across the aisle, so to speak, uh, that you need to be tough on China. I saw that Joe Biden uh, in the campaign said, I will be tough on China. Uh, and I think there is still a sense on the European side that it should be possible, uh, even as we learn to think of China as a systemic rival and not only as used to be the case as a, as a strategic partner or some kind of export market for our BMWs, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think there, is a, there are fundamental differences. You have a more con somewhat more confrontational, strategic uh, uh, thought about China. We are still thinking about it more in limited uh, economic opportunities. We, uh, we share American concerns about intellectual property and, 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 and Huawei and 5G. We're debating this. So my, my point is this. I think that there are many areas where American and European interests regarding China will in fact overlap and where we can define areas where we can even develop a joint approach to China. But it will, it will be useful for you, for, for America, only if you, you are not dealing with respect to China with 27 different European positions. Here again, I repeat that we would do you a favor, in my view, if we came up with something that deserves to be called an EU strategy on China. Uh, some fundamental you know, points, some fundamental bullet points on how we got China, what our vision is, and then we can consult with the State Department, the Pentagon, and others, where's the overlap, where, we, where can we agree, and I, I think there will be significant areas of, of, of potential joint action and close coordination. That's what we need to develop. It's, it's, a, it's very important. I think it, it could be divisive, but it can also be a great area of transatlantic cooperation in the future. Thank you. Jessica. That was a great question, Ambassador Emerson, because we have we have a lot of audience members asking that same question. So I'm I'm very glad you got to that. Uh, Ambassador Ishinger, we've got uh, several questions. I know we're getting close to the end of the hour, so uh, we might go a little bit late. Um, the first question, what is the status and likely outcome of the German debate over nuclear sharing, specifically the German dual capable aircraft and U.S. nuclear weapons? Uh, there is a debate. Uh, we've always had this debate. There are folks in uh, Germany, uh, you have these folks too on the American side who believe that the best way forward is to immediately get, ri get rid of all nuclear weapons, right? Uh, uh, I think that uh, the smart German voter understands that unilateral disarmament in terms of uh, uh, nuclear sharing in, in terms of European countries, including Germany, sharing with the United States the burden of, of creating deterrent, uh, a credible deterrent, uh, remains important so long as we don't see a fundamental willingness on the other side to agree uh, uh, much more, much more far-reaching uh, arms control uh, activities. Having said that, so I think that nuclear sharing and uh, will continue and i think any future german government will be will be well advised to uh, uh, of course to fund uh, the next generation airplane that would be capable of performing these uh, duties but i think what we what we would politically also need is a renewed joint effort by the united states and european allies to 
to look for any opportunities with Russia and others uh, to go in for arms control negotiations. That is an, an, uh, an area that has been largely abandoned by the Trump administration. And I think uh, European, including German opposition to all things nuclear, uh, have been, have been, has been provoked by the absence of meaningful arms control uh, considerations. So I would hope that as a first step, uh, we would hear soon that uh, regardless how this is going to be arranged, that, you know, the uh, uh, new start uh, arrangement between America and, and Russia will be extended. Uh, that would be an initial strong signal in favor of, of, of arms control. That would help in the European context. Sorry, Excuse I was me. muted. Thank you. Uh, okay. What would attribute to the need of the European Union to have the United States mediate in Europe in the 21st century? I think this is from a comment you made at the start of the webinar. Excuse me, I, I had a problem understanding your, the beginning of your <laughs> sentence. Could you just repeat that, please? Of, of course. What would attribute to the need of the European Union to have the United States mediate in Europe in the 21st century? I, I had a very good friend on the American side when I was a senior official in the German Foreign Ministry. Many of you uh, will remember uh, Dick Holbrook, Richard Holbrook, who was uh, like John, uh, like John Emerson, ambassador to the Federal Republic of Germany, and uh, and served in a number of other uh, re uh, responsibilities, including negotiating uh, peace in the Balkans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and Dick Holbrook wrote in the ninth, in the early 90s, a piece for foreign affairs, the title of which, if I remember correctly, was uh, America as a European Power. And, you know, now you may say that, well, that was the early 90s. We're now in 2020. Uh, times have changed. Yes, they have. But I think it is desirable for us, from a European point of view, uh, to have a United States partner at our side who considers themselves, uh, who continue to consider themselves as a European power, as, as involved in Europe. Uh, don't abandon Europe. Uh, we are trying, as John knows better than anyone else, we're trying hard to uh, make us uh, turn into a, into a more adult European personality, but it takes time, and we need uh, we need the superpower America as our um, as our adult uh, partner in a in a in a in a dangerous world, and we believe that um, hopefully Americans understand that when there are really difficult issues for America, we have traditionally turn out to be your best partners among your most reliable allies. My own country, having never sent any soldier anywhere around the world in the post-World War II period, was among the first one. It was a, a huge decision uh, made in uh, at, at the end of 2001 to pay tribute and to participate with the United States in, in dealing with the threat of Al-Qaeda, the 9-11 the type threat, we decided to send troops and we still have to this day troops in Afghanistan. So I think we we think of ourselves as, as uh, reliable partners, sometimes difficult partners, sometimes disagreeing partners, but at the end of the day, useful partners of the United States. And I think that should be the spirit of of uh, the American presence in Europe, not necessarily, you know, with 100,000 or 50,000 uh, troops in, in Germany. That is not the decisive question. The decisive question is, do we agree on the principles of how we want the world to be organized? Do we believe in strong international institutions? Do we believe in the rule of law? Can we defend uh, human rights, uh, whether it's in in, in, in China or in the Middle East or in Africa, uh, do, can we continue to share uh, the values of the West? And I can tell you that my generation 
in Germany uh, would love to be able to say again, the symbol of the West, the symbol of the, 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 the group of nations that we joined after our catastrophe of the 20th century, that symbol is, you know, uh, the White House in Washington. The symbol is the, the city on the hill, um, uh, is the United States. And that, of course, that's been, that's been a challenging thought for the last four years. Uh, I, I hope very much that we can, uh, you know, reconfirm this kind of vision, because that is what, what has kept the transatlantic alliance together uh, in spiritually and, 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 uh, and philosophically over the last half century in a very meaningful way, very meaningful for us Germans. Remember today, I forgot to say that in the beginning, John, to, uh, 31 years today, the Berlin Wall came down. And uh, uh, if, if it hadn't been for, for strong support from the United States, from people in Washington who trusted the German leadership at the time, we would not have obtained uh, unification within a year. Uh, so, uh, you know, this may, may not be uh, present in the minds of 20 year olds today, but it is very present in my own mind and, and in the minds of those who have lived through the Cold War and, 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 and the, the uh, decades afterwards. So we need to keep these memories alive. The United States was the single most important uh, partner who made it happen with, uh, with uh, uh, great and uh, very smart people working with Jim Baker and of course, President George H.W. Bush and Bob Zellig and, and Bob Kimmett and, and those who, uh, who actually uh, did the work, uh, the, the groundwork uh, uh, leading to reunification. That was a, a, a historic moment, not only for Germany, but for, for Europe, the wall was gone. Uh, Europe was no longer divided. America made it happen. Thank you, America. <laughs> well, thank you, Ambassador. Um, and Ambassador Emerson, I'm going to turn this conversation back over to you. Thank you both for a fantastic and very interesting discussion. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica uh, Wolfgang. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And uh, it was great being with you in Bavaria this September. Uh, Look forward to being with you, hopefully in person, but certainly virtually for the Munich Security Conference in February. There may be some listeners who are wondering what your thinking is about that uh, this uh, this February. I mean, we're we're going to have a conference for sure, correct? But just we're going to have a we're going to have a conference. We don't know yet how many people we can invite. But I have just today, and I, I'll happy I'm happy to share this with whoever is uh, watching or listening. I've today signed um, uh, 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 a reconfirmation letter, this time not only to, um, you know, Joe Biden, but to the president-elect of the United States, inviting him and his um, vice president-elect uh, to figure out a way to uh, come to Munich again. I mean, no one has come to Munich more often uh, than Joe Biden as, senator, as a senator in earlier days, as a vice president of the United States, as you know very well, twice, and mm -hmm. uh, and then after uh, uh, his term as vice president, he has he he likes Munich so much that he came back even after serving as the vice president. His last appearance was in 2019, and I know because he told me himself he really liked it. So my hope is that we can figure out a way to have for the first time in in the history of of you know almost 60 years of the Munich Security Conference to have actually a sitting American president talk to Europe about the the, the shared vision, uh, uh, you know, and 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 the way forward. That would be my my hope. Well, that we're would work. We're working. That would be great. You can actually and help. We'll work on it. I'll help you on that one too. We'll work on that. <laughs> that would be great. Anyway, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you uh, all of our listeners. Uh, thanks to the. Uh, uh, Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall, and I'm going to, and of course, the American Council on Germany and my colleague Steve Sokol, and I would like to throw it back to Kim McCleary for the final wrap.
Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador Isinger and Ambassador Emerson. Thank you so much for this timely, informative, and actually so hopeful discussion. We so greatly appreciate the time that both of you spent today with our viewers and our members. And also thank you to Dr. Sokol again for his introductions and his participation.